This is a sculpture called Bird in the Bush by John Buck. In February 2014, it was commissioned by the Rurinsuri Sculpture Foundation for its art centre near Kasese in western Uganda. John's image is emblematic of the work the foundation has undertaken in restoring the surrounding land once derelict back to its former habitat. It is an environment that is once again becoming alive with indigenous plants and wildlife and as the sculpture suggests it is literally bringing birds back to the bush. This sculpture also creates the biggest challenge to date for the dedicated team at Rurinsuri Founders who in the last few years have established the only art bronze casting foundry in the whole of Uganda. This film documents the process that will eventually transform this small maquette into a six foot high bronze. John and a small team from England arrive to find the team have already made a good job of constructing the armature for the sculpture. The armature is padded out with reeds before they apply the clay. It is a fairly rapid process, but the heat here at the end of Uganda's dry season means that clay dries almost immediately and has to be continually dampened. This has to be carefully judged too much water and the clay simply drops off, too little and it quickly hardens and cracks. As the sculpture takes shape, it is necessary to compact the clay against the armature. It is not just the form that is important to this image, but also the spaces that surround the bird and help to describe and define it. Each evening, the sculpture is carefully covered in wet cloths and wrapped in polythene to protect it from drying out. As it is unwrapped, the early morning sun projects its image through the wet sheet. Now the form is roughed out, the refinement of the surface can begin. John decides that the final surface will work best if it is quite heavily textured. This needs a little improvisation and a simple tool is fashioned from an old wood saw blade. The marks will help to unify the form. In addition, they will facilitate the retexturing of the surface in bronze and allow the patina to adhere more readily. In just four days, the clay stage is complete and ready for the foundry team to start the process of making the mould. The sculpture must be divided up into manageable sized pieces. There will be 20 in all, 10 sections on each side. To do this, a network of clay walls must be attached to the surface to divide the mould sections. The moulds are made of casting plaster mixed with crushed ceramic and sand to help them withstand the heat they will be exposed to in the kiln. This mixture is added to water and mixed thoroughly before being carefully applied to the surface of each section. Metal reinforcing is added to give extra strength and help with the dismantling of the segments. The process continues slowly, piece by piece. Throughout and at the end of each day, the whole thing has to be wrapped up again and again to help prevent further drying and cracking of the exposed clay. Painstakingly, the whole sculpture is gradually encased in its 20-piece mould. Okay. I'm just chilling all down the right hand side. Yeah. 
The tricky job now starts of trying to prise the sections apart. A little water can be added as a lubricant, but this refractory material is soft and fragile, and great care has to be taken. Finally, the first section is released and can be very gently lifted away. Some breakages are inevitable, but these are carefully put to one side and can later be repaired. Nerves are on edge at this point in proceedings. If any one of the sections collapses completely, then the whole project will be put in jeopardy. Yet some pieces come away much more easily than expected. Bit by bit, the mould comes apart and the clay, so painstakingly modelled just days before, has to be destroyed. The bronze casting method being used by the foundry is known as lost wax casting. Here in Uganda, the wax arrives accompanied by its own lost bees. The wax is melted and then carefully painted onto the surface of each mould. Gradually, the layers of wax are built up to achieve what will eventually become the thickness of the sculpture in bronze. Wax rods, runners and risers are fixed onto the inner surface of each wax section and will eventually become the channels through which the molten metal will be fed and waste gases expelled. The rods join at the top to form a funnel into which the bronze will be poured. Once the feeding system is complete, the exposed wax is encased in the same moulding material and the completed investment is then ready for its place in the kiln. Even though the sculpture is divided into 20 individual pieces, each complete investment is extremely heavy and takes quite some manhandling to get to the kiln. Once there, the moulds are upended and packed into the kiln. The doorway is bricked up and sealed with clay and the fire is lit. The temperature is gradually increased until the wax melts and drains away. This process takes more than two and a half days with a continuous stoking of wood day and night. The team need to constantly regulate the temperature to keep it around 700 degrees centigrade. Too hot and there is a danger the moulds will crack. Too cool and the gases released into the mould will not ignite and burn away. When the flames of the burning gases have finally died away, the moulds are judged to be ready and the furnaces can be lit. Fueled by waste engine oil, it takes a little careful coaxing. Once the furnace is underway, the moulds can be released from the kiln. At this point, they are still hot and very fragile and so are given a protective layer of plaster bandage. As the bronze melts, the moulds, a few at a time, are carefully positioned close to the furnace. When the crucible is full of molten bronze, it is lifted out and the impurities are scraped from the surface. Each mould is in turn filled to the top with the molten metal. The bronze solidifies almost immediately and the moulds can be taken away and replaced by the next batch. Casting in Uganda is not always easy and factors outside the team's control can play a part. This time, a break in the electricity supply means an enforced halt to proceedings for several hours and when it resumes, casting goes on well into the dark. Next day, 
the filled investments can be carefully broken open. Inside, a section of the sculpture is revealed, complete with its set of runners and risers, faithfully transformed into bronze. These runners and risers and any extraneous bits on the surface have to be carefully cut away and any interior investment material remaining has to be excavated from within. Gradually, over the subsequent days, the surface is cleaned and any blemishes are carefully removed and made good. Each of the bronze segments undergoes this meticulous treatment before they are ready to be finally assembled. During the casting process, some of the sections inevitably warp and suffer a degree of shrinkage. Before the sculpture can be reconstructed, each element needs to be carefully aligned and tacked into position so that the overall Feel form can smooth. be checked for accuracy. Feel the form. In some areas, there are large gaps which need to be filled and the surface texture has to be painstakingly recreated across the seams. Once the team is happy that the sculpture is correct, each piece can be securely welded. The process is not complete until all of the 20 sections have been satisfactorily brought together. It's a good moment for all when the sculpture is finally whole again. Now the sculpture is in one piece, the team needs to try it on its plinth outside the gallery where it will be permanently sited. With a weight of over a quarter of a ton and no lifting gear, this requires care, ingenuity and a bit of improvisation. After manoeuvring it Egyptian style onto the trolley, the sculpture is carefully secured. Now the team's trusty Land Rover is called into action and slowly but surely the heavy bronze is towed up the hill to the gallery. Once it has safely reached the platform, the sculpture is gently towed to the designated spot and carefully manhandled onto the waiting plinth. Night falls as final adjustments are made. The sculpture is now in place, perfectly vertical and correctly oriented outside the gallery. The team will undertake the perilous return journey to the workshops 
where final welding, finishing and patination will take place. Many weeks and hours of work later, the sculpture is at last completed and has been brought back to its permanent resting place. It stands as an enduring statement symbolising the restored environment here in the foothills of the Ruwenzori Mountains.